Well, good evening. Hope you've had a good day. Uh, I hope you got to uh, maybe take a nap like I did this afternoon during the rain. Uh, we're going to be talking about the rest, as Adrian Rogers called this, the rest of your life in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. We've looked at the creation. God is the creator. He created it all out of nothing. The theologians say ex nihilo, out of nothing. Uh, God created, the writer of Hebrews tells us, that by faith we understand the world was framed by the word of God and the things that we see came from things which don't appear. So we uh, have that God created the world, the universe, man, the animals, uh, the plants, the land, the sea, all of that. He spoke, and it was. And so in chapter 2, uh, we come to the end of the creative work uh, of God, and the work of creation uh, is finished. So let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 2. And we'll just read the first three verses. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word that tells us of your creation. We are thankful, Lord, that in you and in Christ we can be a new creation. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to rightly divide your word tonight as we study together, that we would see the rest that we should take and the most important rest, and that would be the rest of our life. We pray that you would help us to see Jesus in this time. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, um, the question comes up from time to time and um, about the Sabbath. We talked about that this morning. And Jesus, to the Pharisees and the Jewish people who had put so much emphasis on the day rather than what the day stood for. Um, and there's still some arguments about that. And I want us to look at this rest that God took as an example, as an emphasis, um, as an expression to us and how we should apply that to our life. And first, I want us to look at the emphasis of the rest. Uh, the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day. Well, did um, it take... Um, all of his energy to create the world or the universe and so then at the end of six days he sort of mopped his brow and said boy I really needed a day off Did was God tired was that the reason he rested uh, I heard a story about a college student that asked um, his pastor about all the planets and the galaxies and all the things that especially now that we can see through the aid of uh, telescopes and satellites and all the planets and the, really the other universes, the other uh, galaxies within the universe. Um, and he asked, did he think there was life on other planets? And the pastor told him, no, he really didn't think there was life on other planets, that God had spoken here. He had spoken to the people on earth. He put man on earth. He sent Christ to earth and he didn't really think that there was life on other planets. And the student asked the pastor, well, why did God go to all the trouble to create all those other planets and galaxies and things? And the pastor said, what trouble? The Bible says on the fourth day, he made the stars also. What an understatement that is. Speaking, I think, of the power of God, the immenseness of God that all that that we can see now in the Bible just says he created that too. There was no trouble. God was not tired. The reason that he rested, God rested 
uh, sort of like we have a, a rest in music for emphasis or to show the ending of something or maybe the starting of something. I heard a story about a little girl who was practicing her piano and her mother was listening from the other room and she um, stopped hearing the music and so she called to her daughter in the next room and said, are you still practicing? Why did you quit? And the little girl said, I'm practicing the rest. So sometimes we need to practice the rest and God rested for emphasis on what he had just done and what was about to come, the world and what he would do in that. Secondly, I want us to see the example of rest. The Bible says that this rest in Genesis chapter 2 is an example of the rest that God chose for his people Israel. In Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11, the Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou or thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maidservant, nor thy manservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gate. So God says the Sabbath day, the seventh day, is a day to rest. And the reason it's a day to rest, verse 11 tells us, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. <clears throat> Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the example of the Sabbath the Old Testament Sabbath, the Sabbath for the people of Israel, is creation. That's another reason I believe it was a literal six-day creation. Um, and God uses that as an example. There are really two commands in this uh, statement about the Sabbath and about rest. We, we get the one naturally about resting. But the other part of that is there is a command not just to rest, but there's a command to work. Jesus worked, and work is not part of the curse. God, uh, God planned for man to work, for Adam to keep the garden and to tend it, but it was after the fall that sin came, and that work would be harder than it was uh, at one time. But work was always a part of God's plan for us, and I think will work. The Bible talks about us serving him in heaven. We're not going to sit around on a cloud uh, and not do anything in heaven. We'll be doing something, I believe, in heaven as well. But the command is to work. In six days, you're to work and do all your work and then rest on the seventh day. Paul says, in fact, in the New Testament, if a man doesn't work, don't feed him. That'll get him back to working. If a man is able to work and won't work, you're not to take care of him like you do other people in the church, as Paul commanded the churches around Asia Minor, to take care of those who couldn't take care of themselves, those who couldn't work, those who were widows indeed, those who didn't have a family to take care of them. We're supposed to take care of those people. But for somebody who just refuses to work, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, I've told you before, if a, if a person doesn't work, they shouldn't eat either. So the uh, worst thing that could happen is for half of the people to think that they don't need to work because somebody else is going to work and take care of them when they can work. And the other half of that coin, if you will, or the other side of that coin is, for the people who are working to think it does no good to work because somebody's going to give away what I work for to somebody else who could have worked. The government, I always uh, am tickled, the government is going to give somebody so much money or give to this or give to that. Well, the government can't give anything to anybody, especially money, without first taking it from somebody else. Um, when somebody gets something without working for it, somebody who worked for it has to go without getting it. And the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does teach us to take care of people who can't work and to help people who can't work. But the Bible tells us that we are to work. 
And that's part of this command, not just to rest, but to work. So there's a command to work. There is a command to rest, and we need that. We are, as we mentioned before, Thessalonians talks about this as well. We're, I believe, part of the image of God as we're three, we're a trinity, not a holy trinity, as God is Father, Son, and Spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. And so we need to rest, to replenish our spirit. That's one of the reasons we meet together to worship, to replenish our spirit. Um, we sing this song. If you're, if you're Baptist, this is one of our traditions. You may not know why. And we sing the word sometimes without, uh, like a lot of hymns, that we don't know what we're uh, singing. But if you're Baptist, you probably sung this after the Lord's Supper. But think about what it is saying as far as replenishing your spirit. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. So we need to meet together and join together and fellowship together and work together to replenish our spirit. Also to refresh our soul, our mind, emotion, and will. Um, we need to... Uh, that needs to be refreshed as well. And also, like my little nap this afternoon, to restore our bodies. The Sabbath day was set aside for Israel to do that. And as we talked about in this morning's message, they had gotten so far away from that true rest and trust in God that they had made it harder to rest than they did to work because they had added so many rules and uh, regulation. But the Sabbath, the seventh day, was for Israel. God says in Exodus 31 to Moses, um, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. So between me and you, the children of Israel, that ye may know that I am the Lord and doth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you, again, the people of Israel. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day rested and was refreshed. So the Sabbath day, the seventh day, was set up for the children of Israel as a memorial, as a covenant between them and God. In the New Testament, the church celebrated on the first day of the week. Why? Have you ever wondered why we go to church on Sunday instead of Saturday? Well, I think the most important reason is the day that Jesus arose from the grave. It was early, the Bible says, on the first day of the week in Mark chapter 16 and verse 9 that Jesus arose. Jesus met with his disciples after the resurrection in uh, John chapter 20 and verse 19 and you remember Thomas wasn't with them so a week later on Sunday night uh, John 20 verse 26 Jesus met with the disciples again and with Thomas in John 20 Jesus commissioned the disciples on Sunday on the first day of the week to go out and to preach the day of Pentecost was um, 49 days seven weeks after uh, the Passover, so that would have been, Pentecost would have been on a Sunday uh, as well. The early church, Acts tells us in several places, Acts 20, verses 6 and 7, Paul is in Troas, and they met, and he preached to them on the first day of the week. 
Um, this is one that always gets me. If you do go to church on Saturday, the Bible set tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, you need to come back on Sunday to take up offering because that's the day you're supposed to set your offering aside is on the first day of the week in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. And then in Revelation 1, the Bible tells us that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's the way the New Testament refers to the first day of the week, which is for the church. The seventh day commemorates the finished work of God and creation. The first day of the week commemorates the new creation. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The seventh day speaks of natural life. The first day speaks of supernatural life. The seventh day speaks of life in Adam and the first day speaks of life in Christ. Romans chapter 5 talks about that. If you're in Adam, you lost, you lost, you lost, you lost, but chapter 5 of Romans tells us in Christ we have much more, much more, much more in Christ. And 1 Corinthians 15 says if you're in Adam, all who are in Adam die, all who are in Christ live. The seventh day commemorates the work of God's hand. The first day commemorates the work of God's heart. The seventh day is a display of God's power. The first day is a display of God's grace. The seventh day was for Israel, and the first day of the week is for the church. Paul tells us in Colossians that when Christ died on the cross, the, the handwriting of ordinances, the King James says, the, the things that were against us, the Bible says Christ took those and nailed them to his cross when someone was... Um, adjudicated guilty they took the sentence and put it on the door if they were in prison this is what this guy's in prison for and it had that handwriting of ordinances in a capital case we might say with Jesus on the cross they would have nailed that uh, what he was being killed for and you remember they put hey, this is the king of the Jews he was an insurrectionist Paul says in a, in a real sense, he took the handwriting of ordinances against us. We had been adjudicated guilty before God and Christ took that handwriting of ordinances and nailed it to his cross and when he died, he died for me. He died for you. Your sins were nailed to the cross. As the song says, and I bear it no more. He took the handwriting of ordinances, nailed it to his cross, triumphing over it. And so Paul says, since that's happened, since Christ has saved us, since we're in him, then he says in, second, in Colossians 2, verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of of things to come, but the body is Christ. So the Sabbath was a picture of what would come. It was a shadow of things would come. Paul says we have the body now. We have the, the real person, not just the shadow. And we shouldn't get caught up in uh, days and feasts and all these different ceremonies. Our focus should be on Christ. The emphasis of the rest, the example of the rest, the expression of rest. We rest in him. Adrian Rogers put it this way, God worked and then he rested in creation. Jesus worked and then he rested in salvation. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, but this man, talking about Jesus, our high priest, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus worked and then rested so that we could rest and then work. In the Old Testament, men worked six days and rested on the seventh. In the New Testament, if we're Christians, we're supposed to rest in him trust in him so that we can work. 
Jesus said. We've been studying Matthew, and we talked about this passage not long ago. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Salvation is not about our efforts. It's about what Christ has already done. Paul talks about Abraham in Romans 4. And he says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, if you go to work and they write you a check every other Friday or whenever you get paid, that's what's supposed to happen. If you work, you get paid. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Paul tells Titus, It's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And Paul tells the Ephesians, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Even the faith is not of yourself. That's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's by grace through faith, unto good works. And if we keep it in that order, we'll have our theology straight. If we, a lot of times, we get it exactly opposite. We want to, we think sometimes if we can do enough good works, then we can come to Christ. And that's exactly opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches it's by grace. God initiated, God started, God did all the work. All we can do is receive it, but once we do receive it, there's something for us to do. We rest first, and then we work. If you get it backwards, it won't work at all. We are to rest in him. The writer of Hebrews says, and I think we've talked about this passage in the last few weeks, but anyway, it, it'll be worth reading again. Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 3. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left to us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished." from the foundation of the world. So, the writer of Hebrews here is talking about the people coming to the up to the edge of the promised land. They heard the message, but they rejected it. And because they rejected it, they couldn't enter into that rest of God. The writer of Hebrews says, don't be that way. Enter into his rest by believing him, by trusting him. Don't fall short by not believing, by not trusting by not receiving him. The emphasis of rest by God in creation, the example of rest in creation and the Sabbath day, the um, emphasis of rest, it's by uh, faith or the expression of rest. We rest and trust in him so that we might have eternal rest. There's, well, a couple of passages I want to share with you as we close. <clears throat> there is an eternal rest and an eternal unrest. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, if we trust him, we can enter into his rest now. But then he says in verses 9 and 10, there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So when we come to Christ, we cease from our work because 
we don't work to gain our salvation, but because we've entered into his rest, then we can work for him. But there's a day coming when there will be a rest, another rest for the people of God. Unfortunately, the Bible says in Revelation 14 that there's also no rest for those who don't know God. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, Revelation 14, 11 says. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So don't you want to enter into the rest of your life to know him and then once you know him, once you trust him, when you don't have to measure up because he's already measured up, then you're free to work and to serve and to go for him. I heard a story about a group of tourists who went to a castle in Europe and they had hoped to be able to go in and go through the castle and see all the rooms and the tapestries and the different things in the castle. And they got there and the caretaker was there and they asked him if he could, they could go inside. And, and he said, yes, uh, the, just go through this hall and there's a door there and you can go in and see um, all the things in the castle. Well, they went and they found the door <clears throat> And there was a large key there in the door and they worked and turned and twisted and worked and worked and worked and couldn't get the key to turn. And so they came back to the caretaker again and they said, you know, we're sorry. I guess we weren't doing it right or something, but we were unable to get in. We were un unable to turn the key and open the lock and we couldn't get in. And the caretaker said, oh, I'm sorry. I meant to tell you. <clears throat> The door is unlocked. All you had to do was go in. The work has already been done and we enter into the rest of Christ that we may know him and then there is work for us to do but we trust him for salvation and not our own works. We rest in him that we may do the work that he gives us to do. We trust him as this story goes. The door has already been unlocked by Jesus. All we can do is enter in. And that's what he tells us. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. And he with me, I will be his God. We can enter into his rest so that we can be his. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the creation story, your power, your might, your grace, your love. We pray that you would help us, that we would not frustrate the grace of God, that we would trust you and only you and not our works, but we would enter into the rest of our life through Jesus Christ, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen.